Hi everyone and welcome to the first of Teach First Future Teams Future Terms panels. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Just a couple of things before we jump in um, into the meat of the conversation. Just wanted to remind you all that this session is being recorded. Um, so just bear that in mind. Second thing to say is that alongside obviously the discussion we're about to have today, we're also going to have a, um, a live debate running. So on social media, the handle is hashtag future terms panels. Please do use that. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Bidu Sood Nichols and I am the director of fundraising here at Teach First. I've been involved in Teach First for a long time. I taught on the program in 2004 in South London. And um, more recently, I have found myself teaching again uh, rather reluctantly, my eight and 10 year olds keep reminding me that this is not my day job and I should stay, stay doing what I do. Um, and I have to admit, um, I feel like I'm better off um, doing this rather than helping them. So hopefully they've been primed not to, to interrupt us, but, um, but that's a little bit about me. Um, I suspect that um, you know, if, you're, if you're joining us today, and I know we've got a wide range of, of colleagues from across the sector here, um, part of the reason why is you're just as interested and, and committed to making sure that when we are, as we embark on our road to recovery, you know that schools will be at the heart of that. Teachers, school leaders, you know, they will be absolutely fundamental to how we respond to a country um, in, in the wake of the crisis, in the wake of COVID. Um, and the other thing that really struck me about this was that I also imagine most of us are really thoughtful very thoughtful about what this has meant, what this means for, for those young people who will be hardest hit, honestly, by, by COVID. So that's why I think it's really interesting, really delighted we've got such a brilliant panel talking um, about the recovery for those hardest hit. So I'm going to introduce our panel. The way today will work is um, they will each have four to five minutes to share their views on how they think um, the road to recovery will be for people's hardest hit by COVID, and then we will open the session up to questions and answers. So um, without further ado, our first panelist today is Dame Alison Peacock, who is the CEO of the Chartered College of Teaching. Um, we are also joined today by uh, Pedro de Broker, who is joining us, dialing in from Ghent in Belgium. Um, uh, so it's brilliant to have you, Pedro, with us. We are also joined this, this afternoon by Nathan Delaria. Nathan is a retired footballer um, and is now a uh, assistant head teacher at one of our partner schools in Manchester. And finally, we have Professor Becky Francis here, who is the CEO of the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, so it's absolutely lovely to have you all with us. Um, so like I said, a really good opportunity to get a broad, broad range of views from, from colleagues across the sector, some serving in schools very much at the moment, others who've got experience of working in other countries, um, and then also um, those more involved in policy and actual shaping of the system. So um, I will hand over first and foremost to Alison to kick us off. Thank you very much indeed. So this issue is not a new issue. It's just accentuated by the situation we find ourselves in. As we are probably aware, the society in Britain is one of the most unequal in the world. And the reason that I'm a trustee for Teach First and I work with Teach First is because the mission of trying to do something about how we support our marginalized communities, our least advantaged youngsters is always important. But of course, right now, all of these things have been brought into sharp relief. We know that there is a, a massive digital divide. We know that Teach First is trying to do something about that with some of the schools that it's supporting, but it's a much bigger problem than, than any one organization can help. And the resources being provided by the DfE are really just um, a very small part of what needs to happen. Because where you've got young people who are not able to connect effectively with school, that's where we've got the, the most risk of the greatest disadvantage. And later on in this conversation, um, Becky Francis will no doubt talk about the report that's recently produ been produced by EEF. But our own research at the Chartered College, we have a, a research we've done about education in times of crisis. We've looked at the work of uh, the Sutton Trust. We've looked at the work of the EEF in terms of uh, summer schools and what might be helpful there. 
all of these things are in the background to what I'm talking about. In addition, the, the connections that we are making at the Chartered College with teachers all over the world helps us to realise that at the moment, in conversations with colleagues from many, many countries, some of which have got much a much e more equal society and much greater connectivity, that the most important aspect of trying to help children is the connection they have with their teacher. And this is where... You know, sometimes these kinds of conversations, these kinds of panels, you could come away from it if you're not careful, feeling so sort of helpless about the fact that the, the problem is vast and it's getting greater and you can't individually sort out poverty at a stroke. But what, what does seem to be really apparent is that the relationship that the teacher establishes with the student, regardless of the, um, the methodology in terms of remote learning, is the most important thing. It's the quality of the teaching, it's the scaffolding, it's the feedback, it's the teacher actually knowing the student really well and being able to engage with them that makes all the difference. And if you're listening to this or engaging with this panel and you are a teacher yourself, that should give you some sense of hope because that means there's something that you're probably already doing and definitely something that you can do in the future if you're about to start teaching next year. It will be that relationship that you establish. The other thing to say is from the point of view of the individual child, there will be children who not only are suffering the effects of deprivation and learning loss, but children who are suffering bereavement. And in the survey that we've done through the Chartered College, we've surveyed nearly 1,800 teachers, the vast majority of whom said they felt really rather underprepared to know what to say and what to do and how to help with a child who has recently been bereaved. It's one of the last taboos in our society. As a head teacher myself over many years, unfortunately, I did have to deal with some of these situations with families who'd suffered bereavement, with children who'd lost parents in very tragic circumstances. And the most important thing is that it's about how you connect, as I, as I say, it's about acknowledging the loss. It's about saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear what's happened. It's about not dwelling on things that maybe they don't want to talk about, but the, the recognition, that this, is, this has happened to somebody in your class or somebody that you know in your school is really important because not to say anything would be to deny that that has happened. And when someone is going through a bereavement, they're suffering shock. So of course, things like learning, they, they just go to one side because they're not important. So I think that very personal interaction that you will have as a teacher with your students is the most important thing and that's certainly what uh, we're finding from our experience of talking to teachers all over the world. Just to give you one example, talking to someone in South Korea recently where they've got 98% connectivity, the children had all got a remote curriculum, they could all, uh, the national curriculum, they could all log on to, but what they were finding was it was the classes where the teacher was then interacting with that curriculum that was, that was feeding back to the students, scaffolding their learning, talking about what had happened that actually enabled them to make the greatest progress. And the ones where there wasn't that relationship Somebody at the end of a computer or on a screen who doesn't know you, who's delivering the most wonderful lesson maybe, just doesn't have the same impact. So I guess my, my uh, introduction to this panel is to say teachers really matter and we're certainly finding that out at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And that connection point is, is yeah, really pertinent. Thank you. Uh, Pedro, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dame uh, Alison, because uh, I can add to this. Um, we've known for quite a while that a lot of the things we do to try to make education more fair. Um, I, I don't like to discuss the gap because the gap suggests that there's nobody, that there are two, two groups and nobody in between. But actually it's about education being unfair because the background plays a, a huge role for some children and makes it unequal. And a lot of the things we do in education often makes inequality bigger. Uh, there is a study of Dietrich Sonnen uh, in, from 2017, Dietrich Sonnen and colleagues, and there are only a limited amount of things that actually make the influence of the social background smaller. And uh, the four are cooperative learning, but not just by putting children together, but again, the teacher is so important to guide them through this uh, learning 
together. Uh, small group instruction, but again, and that's something I, I want to add on what was said before. Often we make a mistake when we discuss small group instruction for children who need more uh, help, is that they get it not from their own teacher. What we often do is we take another teacher, a remedial teacher, to help them, and they are not taught by the person who knows them best, where they have a connection with. So it's very important to have small group instruction, maybe favorably by their own teacher. Again, feedback and progress monitoring, very important. And the, the biggest influence was tutoring. And I think tutoring can be a very important role, but by trained tutors, because just putting people there to uh, as a buddy or without any knowledge of scaffolding or uh, actual teaching, the benefit will be rather small. For the past few months, I was involved here in Belgium uh, helping the government to uh, deal with the situation. And we discovered a very important extra element. And that's the element of uh, stigmatization. Because what you'll get is you want to help those children. But by doing it, you also get put an arrow above their head sometimes towards the other children. And so we had to find ways to do to help them without giving a, a signal to all their friends that they are poor, for instance. So uh, small things we've done is schools were allowed very early on to ask children to come to school. Children that the schools thought that needed it without a lot of emphasis in the media that children were coming back to school because they needed help. And another element what we, we did, we've done is that um, in selecting which groups could come to school, if you listened to the, the media coverage, you wouldn't have known that it was actually to pinpoint certain groups in society because they were most often in that area or in that situation. So I think for the future, this will still be very relevant because while helping those children, um, we don't want to put a label on them. And that's a very difficult um, equilibre that we have to fight for. A last thing that I want to suggest for the future. Quite often we think in education about remedial, not about preventing. And for instance, if somebody has done something, uh, has learned something in classroom and didn't understand it that well, we will organize remedial classes. But for instance, pre-teaching, pinpointing where there are needs among students so that they can follow those classes later on, preparing them instead of remediating, remediating them, gives a better feeling and can be more effective. And I think this is something, if you look to the curricula, that will be very important for the future. Instead of thinking what have they lost or what have they not learned enough, it's more important to look what will they learn and what do they need to follow those classes next uh, year. I think that could help them also giving um, feelings of uh, accomplishment. Oh, I was able to follow the use classes. Uh, so that's just what I wanted to suggest. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And I love that idea of um, being really mindful of the stigmatization as well and just being really, really sensitive to that. That's really useful. Thank you. Nathan, we'll come to you next as, um, as someone who's in schools at the moment. It would be great to get your views as well. Oh, for, oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you, first of all, for helping, uh, you know, for, for allowing me to come on and share my experience in this platform. Um, so I think that the problems that, that we're facing, and particularly myself in the position I'm at in my school, it's, it's a kind of multifaceted problem in that we have been working really, really hard to support students at this particular time. And, you know, as has been mentioned about the digital um, you know, the digital gap and the availability of digital resources of some students is something that at first at the start of this period of lockdown, um, my school and other schools a lot, a lot of the time, because of the kind of immediate nature of it, we did put a lot of um, material online and we were using a lot of online platforms. 
Now, we were monitoring the use of this very closely and we found that there was a large proportion of students who weren't access accessing these online platforms. Like with anything, it would be the case that some were choosing not to do it, but equally a number of students were unable to do so. So I know a number of schools, in, including ours, we then kind of revised our strategy a little bit and we sent a lot of things out at the cost of the school um, via paper format. And then we also did a lot of, um, we had a lot of welfare checking on all families, um, but particularly some of those who we had a focus on to make sure and to see if there were any barriers that we ourselves could address. Now, there's an obvious danger as we start thinking about um, reopening schools to just purely get students in the door and start, you know, start covering content, covering, um, you know, the learning that they would have lost. I think like with anything, students need to feel safe in an environment that they're at, that they're in. Again, all students, regardless of kind of their socioeconomic status, we don't know what was going on necessarily at the time when they spent away from, um, away from the classroom and away from education. And I do think it's really important for us as teachers, which we've been focusing on, is to ascertain the kind of, you know, the, the state that the children are at when they return to school. And while still understand, understanding that they've missed a lot of a, a socialisation process with the peers that they would have naturally gone through. And I do think, you know, if students don't feel safe, don't feel comfortable, um, you know, kind of education and, and the learning that we want to get done in the classroom will actually come second to that. So I know um, what we have been doing and our kind of original plan, and I know it's a similar plan to a lot of high schools in this country is, um, you know, when students first come back in, it will be that kind of that really that pastoral um, care, that pastoral support in terms of, you know, have you been able to do any work? If you have, brilliant. If you haven't, you know, we need to put a plan forward going through. Um, it's it, it's concerning, obviously, the health and safety of everybody is, is, is uh, the utmost importance, and we all understand that and we all acknowledge that. Um, the longer such a, an absence from normal schooling goals is, is more concerning in, in a number of contexts in terms of future prospects, in terms of grades, but equally... Um, the, the kind of the role of the teacher and the in in that personal connection with the students is going to be so crucial when the students do return. I would echo the points that have been made about um, the interaction being key and how you know tutoring and little small group interactions, even at this time, is fantastic. It's something we're thinking about, but then also trying to balance the problems that we've had about um, interaction online. Our school, for example, like a number of schools. And we were really excited about um, the promise from the government of support with laptops, but we've actually found it really hard to access that mm -hmm. provision. Um, and we've actually been really grateful at our school in Manchester about more regional provisions that have been set up that have allowed us to access um, laptops via those schemes, whereas, um, you know, we've not actually had the filtered down um, laptops, just as one example from the government. Um, was it's, yeah, it's something that I think um, it's it's really pressing, it's really key, and it's something I'm I'm really passionate about in ensuring that you know once students do return, um, we do look after their welfare, and we're not just thinking you know oh how much of a math specialist, how much math can we can we give them straight away, and um, you know I do think it's something that we're really trying to consider. I think that's a, that's a theme that's already come through really strong, hasn't it? That connection to teachers, the stigmatization piece that, you know, the, the fact that you're talking about their welfare, there's a, a bit of a theme emerging. So let's, let's move on to Becky um, and then we'll open up to questions and discussion. Thanks very much. Um, so I'll make a couple of uh, remarks about uh, the gap with apologies to Pedro for the language and um, then a couple of remarks about recovery uh, before we open up. So some of you, uh, Alison's already mentioned kindly um, the release of the latest EEF analysis on uh, gap widening during uh, lockdown. You'll be aware that between 2011 and 2019 in the UK, the, the attainment gap narrowed somewhat in both primary and secondary schools. But unfortunately, school closures due to coronavirus are, are likely to reverse this trend. Um, our analysis that was published yesterday, which was based on a systematic review of the literature on school closures, 
suggested that the gap at the end of primary school could widen between 11% to 75% between March and September compared to its current size. Now, of course, that does come with some caveats um, because, of course, school closures due to coronavirus are very different in many ways to that summer learning loss that many of these uh, high quality studies have been based on. And so, of course, um, many people would point out, well, during the summer holidays, you know, um, schooling isn't taking place at all. At present, schooling has been taking place. And as we know, um, schools and teachers have been incredibly creative in their efforts to get uh, provision to young people in, uh, through remote learning. Um, but of course, on the other hand, those differences might Im imply that actually our projections are conservative, because as all the polling done in the interim has shown, while remote learning has helped uh, many, many children, the degree to which disadvantaged kids have engaged has on average been lower than for other kids across all metrics. And of course, there are many obvious reasons why we might see those differentials widening. Um, you know, access to tech has already been mentioned. Um, resources in the home are unequal. And of course, there's also unequal of ability of parents to be able to lend that support. So for all those reasons, we anticipate the gap to being very wide. And then, of course, the situation has rapidly changed in the interim. So to start with, we were talking about mitigation during school closures and then compensation once schools reopen. But very quickly, of course, we've seen that it's not going to be like that. There's going to be a very gradual process of reopening where we're actually going to see increased complexity and diversity as some kids are in school, some are having to still learn remotely, and that this situation could last for a long time. So what I would say is that we're going to need, rather than thinking about sort of one-off uh, interventions, short-term suggestions over the summer or whatever, we're going to need to draw very carefully on the evidence about what we do know about effective practice and think about a programmatic uh, approach to this, I would be recommending a, a thinking about a programme across at least two years of holistic provision, drawing on the comments that have already been made about thinking about well-being and so forth, as well as academic content, of course, um, to think about, you know, what do we know are our best bets? The EEF, of course, has its promising projects, we know about focusing um, on literacy and numeracy as the key planks to support later learning. Um, but, you know, thinking about um, an early start for, for, for children there. And several colleagues have already mentioned as well the promise of one to one or small group tuition as something that it has to be high quality, as I think um, Pedro uh, mentioned. But um, nevertheless, uh, uh, strongly shown to be effective um, and something that we at the EEF have been promoting. So I think we're going to need to think creatively and collaboratively about supporting recovery at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. And I think it almost underscores the fact that it isn't, it's not going to be something that we get right from September to the October half term. We've really got to be looking at this with a much longer lens and I the thing that I'd be really interested in and as, as the sort of first question to the panel um I guess would be how how do you think this experience of schools the disruption to schools what's the possibility of it fundamentally changing the shape of education to what extent do you think we can actually radically change the way we see education we'll start with that and then we've got some questions coming in from um, our participants as well don't expect too much um, because uh, a lot of people think, yeah, we have had a big crisis, so everything will change. But what I've seen from the countries who are coming back to normal is that normal is really old-fashioned normal quite often. Uh, I think the best thing we can hope for 
are two things. One thing we can hope for is that uh, teachers are more able to use technology, that they are less afraid to use it, because often you see that there is a, they use a lot of technology outside of the classroom, but they are reluctant sometimes more to use technology in the classroom or for the learning. That can be a benefit. And one thing I also hope, but I say deliberately hope, is that uh, this problem of inequality will be more in the forefront of the discussion. Uh, that if those two things happen after the crisis or because of the crisis, I would be very happy, actually. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, I think um, there's, there's quite a few things with that. I think it's really important that we do learn the lessons that, um, you know, that, that we have seen in this, this, um, this period of time. Um, one that I particularly think about is um, within my role, I've been uh, responsible with, uh, for the year 11 students for helping award their centre assessed grades because obviously they've not been able to do their GCSEs. And, you know, I've been reading quite a few things, not, uh, none of which have been produced by Ofqual or the DfE about how um, it could have a wider implication on assessments going forward. Um, a lot of emphasis has been put on teachers to look at the students, to have that real personal connection with the students and know exactly what the students deserve based on their knowledge of, of the kids. Now, it's quite often that a number of students, they work really well in class and they fall down on the actual assessment. And if a teacher could then intervene on, you know, um, how well they think they're doing and the grade that they deserve from a, from a professional basis and not in terms of, um, you know, oh, this is my favourite student. Um, I do think that's really important. And I think it's something that um, could, I don't know how, could be kind of brought into a wider scope. The actual, um, you know, the professional opinion of the teacher and students. Um, it's, it's, that being said, it has been a really, really hard process of, um, you know, awarding grades at this particular point, especially when you think about the grades that are awarded by the teacher um, can then go on. Um, you know, then can, can then go on to determine the next step in students' lives. So it's a balance. I think it can be a positive and it can be a strength in certain situations when um, teacher input, um, you know, and a teacher input and that knowledge that every good teacher has of their particular students can really go hand in hand in helping providing them and get on the next step of that ladder, but equally balancing that in the case of, uh, you know, making sure that it's not exploited and that decisions aren't made that would kind of ruin the, the, the validity of um, an assessment model. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I think it's really fascinating, isn't it? How much will we take from this that does shift the way we work? And um, yeah, before long, how quickly will we just fall back into our, our old way of doing things? Um, I'm going to move us on. We've got a couple of really good questions coming through. So um, we've talked a lot about things like small class interventions, tutoring, etc. There's a question here about summer schools. Um, and it says there's been a debate about introducing summer schools, especially for more disadvantaged pupils. Um, would the panellists support measures like that? And what would the risks be of, of, of something like that? So, Becky, can I come to you first and then we'll go to Alison. Happy to talk about this, having um, spoken about it at the select committee yesterday. Um, yeah, I, I think I would just reiterate, I think we need a programmatic approach to this. Um, I'm sure that many different approaches have a role to play, um, but I would encourage thinking where we drive resources based on what we know as well. Um, so summer schools have been shown that they can be effective. Um, they tend, however, to be effective if they have very strong academic content and delivering that in the present situation at short notice over the summer with the various issues that both kids and teachers have had that various panel members have remarked on already, I think is challenging. And then secondly, there's the point that um, the evidence has systematically shown that many interventions have struggled to persuade the, the, the young people that they wish to attend, i.e. disadvantaged young people, to actually attend summer schools. So um, what we wouldn't want, of course, is to actually exacerbate gaps further. 
So I think that thinking about the purpose of those summer schools, sometimes I think in the debates there's been suggestion that these could be um, almost a kind of re-socialisation, uh, getting kids back in terms of their well-being, thinking about transitions and so forth. And of course, that's one uh, purpose. Um, but if we're thinking about, you know, um, recovery of learning loss and so forth, um, I think that needs to be thought about quite carefully. And I would see very much definitely a piece in the jigsaw rather than the piece, if I'm making sense. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would agree with all of that. I think there's uh, a tendency sometimes for those outside the school system to for it all look to, to look terribly simple. And uh, all we need to do, we've got these buildings, haven't we? They would be empty otherwise. We just need to bring the children back, give them some high quality tuition, um, and then it'll all be all right. And the reality is it's far more complicated than that. I also think that our teachers have been vilified in the press and yet in large degree have been working so hard. They've worked through holidays. They've been trying to understand how to teach in a very different way. They've been working, going out into their communities. They've been delivering food. They've been printing off resources. They've been counsellors. They've, And then most recently, if you work in the primary sector, they've actually been inviting children back into school and they've been responsible for risk assessments and cleaning and everything else. And I, I, think, our, I think our teachers are amazing and um, I, I'm incredibly proud to, to lead an organisation that, that supports them. But I think if we were to imply somehow that they also needed to be in throughout the summer holidays, we risk exhausting our workforce to a point that when we really need them to be completely kind of re-energised and, and really focusing on the needs of our students, whether it's through that blended learning offer, however we, whatever it looks like in September, if we don't give them a break, um, <laughs> they're going to run out of steam because you know having been a teacher all my life I absolutely know that when you get to the end of term you almost you almost crawl through the door at home so we'll go oh thank goodness we haven't given teachers that space and um, so I think the, the as Becky says when we look at the research we need our students to be in really high quality teaching situations with teachers who don't necessarily actually, they don't have to have known the students, but they need to establish that, that very kind of high quality relationship of tutor and child, teacher and child, um, and, and offer some sustained high quality academic learning. I'm just not sure who the students are that would most benefit from that. It may be that there's a case to call to say, our year 10s going into a year 11 would really benefit from that. But we need to have a, 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 a group of colleagues willing and ready to teach who could also have a break around the edge of that. So I think it's quite a complicated problem that looks simple from the outside. Great, thank you. And I think, you know, we um, Teach First did a, a survey using TeacherTap and a number of about 61% of the teachers who uh, responded said they'd be open to doing something like that. But the, the message that is coming from this panel is it needs to be part of a wider more holistic approach and that those teachers need to be well rested on you know either at the start or at the end of it so um worth bearing in mind thank you um so moving on i think uh pedro i'd like to take for you to take this one please um and the the question is around how how do you sensitively manage the stigma um for pupils who have potentially been in schools because they're in vulnerable situations um, you know, so when schools, as and when schools do open more broadly, what are some good ideas to reduce that stigma? Well, um, it's difficult, but from the examples I've seen uh, the past few months, both in the Netherlands and in Belgium and in other countries, uh, first of all, if you already have a connection, if you sometimes have moments that you discuss, it's not a mistake to have one-on-one -on -one conversations to look how the situation is in a family. I give you an example. There was a teacher in Holland who noticed that one of his students was acting very differently uh, online than that he knew that student in the classroom. So he asked to have a conversation and um, they found out there were really horrible situation at home because what we often forget is that for some students, uh, schools are a safe, haven uh, where they can have some time off from difficult situations at home. So then that school decided that without putting a lot of uh, emphasis on it to 
uh, allow that student to come to school a couple of hours a day. Uh, the other students at that time didn't know about it because he was also just participating online, but it was he was able to take place, to take part in the school. And I think that we'll have to be very sensible and also not only look at social economic background, because uh, I, I don't know who said it before, but a lot of children, even if they are more wealthy, will maybe also have been in very dire situations. And so I think it's much better to put an emphasis that we want to help every child and every child maybe needs a different kind of help, but everybody is worth helping. And by doing this, by putting out this message, maybe you can uh, drop the stigmatization. It sounds a bit uh, naive maybe, but um, it's a way of trying it. Excellent, thanks. And Nathan, given that you're in school at the moment, have you, how have you managed that potentially? How's that balance being struck? Yeah, I think exactly that Pedro's last point is actually really, really key to that. When I look kind of in the context of the, the the students who've been accessing provision at our school at the moment, it is actually a really um, mixed, um, you know, a mixed demographic kind of social, social econ- from a social economic point. And I think having that idea that it's it's you know it's, it's provisions that, it's, that, that are acceptable or, or are available for all, regardless of their context, is really really key. And you know, it really is not just the, um, you know, the disadvantaged pupils who will be needing that extra support. And, you know, I've seen that from a from a personal perspective in our schools. Um, it's, it's something that is definitely there to consider because as much as we try and as much as, as school leaders, we do our best to ensure that this the, the, the stigma that has been there kind of is eradicated, there will be an undercurrent of it at, at, to some level. But it's again, it's the the, the kind of in- inclusivity of of how we make it and how we approach it and how we phrase it. I do think that will really mean, um, you know, that we can do our best to kind of eradicate that. Brilliant, thank you. And um, so we've got a couple again, you know, in the context of um, this is about the big picture. What are the what are the interventions? What are the things we need to do to to minimize the impact of lost learning there's a couple of questions that have come in about how about longer school days do we need to re- reframe the curriculum um, changes to school holidays so it'd be really interesting to get the panel's view on that and I was thinking Becky would you like to start and then Alison come in and then we'll go and we'll get views from others as well thank you um I, th- I think the it's, it's great to have that debate. And again, I think we need to um, do, stick tightly to the evidence. Um, I've been focusing on sort of curriculum content and where to focus that in terms of uh, um, whether it's sort of uh, one-to-one high quality tuition support, whether it's extra focus on, on, on ensuring um, literacy and numeracy and so forth. Um, clearly, individual um, maps and schools, uh, local authorities may want to look at issues around um, school day and so forth. But I think those have to be carefully balanced with the issues that have already been uh, raised in terms of um, pupil and also, as Alison says, teacher well-being. Um, and also with the evidence about how much difference uh, um, some of those interventions make. Um, I think, though, it's absolutely right that we're thinking about this creatively and holistically, as I've said already. You know, it can't just be um, one or two things. So I think that the very fact that people are engaging in this creatively is a really good starting point. I'd also want to say that I think there's a real um, opportunity to capitalise on our professionalism in terms of focusing on the the relationships and the high quality that all the panelists have drawn attention to. Um, CPD supporting uh, teachers to face um, the the issues and sort of uh, delivery challenges at present, I think are very important. But we may also get some positive opportunities through the uh, hopefully, you know, great new cohorts of, of teachers coming through Um, perhaps both tempted by the uh, promise of higher wages thanks to the government interventions uh, last year and also of course um, sadly due to probably coming uh, economic squeeze and recession um, teaching becomes more appealing so there are um, some some, um, positives 
um, I think, coming online um, in, in that regard. Yes, and, and I, I think we have to be wary of thinking that more is always better and that that's the way to sort everything out. When I became a head teacher, I took over a school that was in a really dire state. It was in special measures and hadn't made any progress and its results were desperately low. And uh, the interim head before me had tried to raise standards by just narrowing the curriculum right down to the core basics, um, doing catch-up classes after school, all of these kinds of things. And actually, it hadn't worked and no progress had been made. And and what did work was building a a really high-quality professional learning uh, amongst the team, a sense of confidence, a sense of coaching, individual knowledge of children, working in a way that didn't um, set limits on children, we weren't labelling children. All of these things are really important because, and I I pick up on on what Pedro was talking about at the beginning, because the the government narrative is about that the schools have always been open for key workers' children and vulnerable children. If you're one of those children that's been invited back because you've got an education healthcare plan or you're, you're being supported by a social worker, who wants to be called vulnerable? Nobody wants to be called vulnerable. And, and I'm sure there are probably <laughs> youngsters who may otherwise have sought the sanctuary of school when school's always been quite a good place who now feel, well, I'm not sure I want to be identified as, as one of these children. I don't want to be there. So we have to be so careful not to, not to sort of single some children out and say, you're going to need more help than others because your circumstances aren't as good as someone else's circumstances. We have to be very careful not to make judgments about what goes on and we have to make very be very careful not to judge quality of what might be happening in the home because particularly with our youngest children, if they have a really loving relationship with a parent and they engage in lots of conversation and they take part in the cooking and things that are going on around the house, they will be learning. It won't be the kind of learning that you're setting when you're in a classroom, but they still will be learning and we have to be really careful not to judge that and and assume it's wanting. I I, I feel there's a real risk that we we kind of wring our hands about some groups of children in society when actually in the past we haven't supported them at all. Not us, more widely. Society hasn't supported those children through uh, greater uh, equity. That's... um... Thank you. And so reassuring as a parent who's trying to educate at home as well, but <laughs> the cooking and the doing the chores and all the rest of it is just as valid in terms of learning. So um, thank you for that. Um, there's, there are, I know that there are a number of questions coming through about uh, well-being and mental health, but we'll pick those up in future panels. Today, I'm just really keen to think more broadly about intervention. So um, I will remind everyone about future panels Um, towards the end of the session. Um, I wanted to open up now to the conversation around um, ethnic ethnic minority pupils. So massively pertinent all over the news at the moment. Um, But so the question is, you know, the BAME community are already more affected than other sectors of the population. How, How can teachers and school leaders support those communities in this transition back to school? So I'm open, big question. Yeah. Can I, can I just start? Because um, I sent a, a tweet this morning about this because it really occurs to me that I was on a call last night with colleagues from the States and also from South Africa where there's huge unrest and um, real angst and, and anger. And we've seen it in this country as well. And I think this is symptomatic of... of huge issues that have been ongoing for a long time, but they're brought closer to the surface by the fact that we're all incredibly stressed and worried about a pandemic. You know, this is, this hasn't, (laughs) this has affected all of us. And I think we're all just trying to kind of cope on the surface. And I was saying this morning, how much we miss schools more than ever, because school is somewhere where typically those conversations, those debates, those deep kind of opportunities to reflect and hear balanced arguments That's something that schools do incredibly well, even schools where they're working with our youngest children right the way through to colleges and universities. There's a space there where where you're able to articulate your views in a way that doesn't resort to violence. You're you're being able to use reason and, and to listen. And when schools are closed, as they are currently, that makes the whole issue that much worse because things get bottled up, I fear. And there may well be some schools that are managing to have these conversations um, 
online. I don't know, but it can't be the same as seeing people face to face. I think there's a risk. We miss our schools. <laughs> What we've experienced, our schools have been opening uh, gradually for the past few weeks, is that uh, some uh, ethnic minorities are not coming to schools because uh, we discovered that there is a big, a bigger fear amongst them. And the only way we can handle this is by community workers. Uh, they have played a vital role for the past few weeks in forming them because we... Besides the unrest, this is also an, an important element because, yes, schools are a great place, but some of them aren't coming to school because their parents are too afraid uh, because of COVID. And so this have, has shown to be an even bigger challenge because, yes, you open the schools, but it doesn't give the answer to every child yet. And let's have Nathan and then Becky will we'll, uh, wrap up with your thoughts on that question. Yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult one. Uh, my school in, um, in Manchester, in Loretta, we actually serve um, uh, a community that has got a high percentage of students from ethnic minorities. And it is a concern and ultimately parents will have the final say on whether they feel safe enough um, on, bringing, on sending the children to school. We're focusing on making sure it is safe. Kind of going back to um, a point that Dame Alison mentioned, I think it is an opportunity um, with students from ethnic mi minorities, but all students, to really, when students come back into school, to really try and increase and improve the kind of cultural capital that they've got, finding opportunities to really um, expose students and, ha and have conversations that they, they would have missed. Um, cultural capital is something that we've been really working on at our place in particular, looking at prospects down the line when they leave school, fully equipping students from ethnic minorities, from different social economic backgrounds, and um, you know, to really have the tools to go out and succeed in, in an ever changing world. And you know, we could talk for ages about the, what's going on in different parts of the world in different situations. And I think it's really important that those conversations are had when students come back into school. Yeah, so I, that, I, I agree with the, those points. And, and um, I think it's um, probably important to highlight, you know, the additional fear from BAME families is, of course, well justified, you know, seems to be being uh, justified by the science. So it's so understandable. And I think that that's um, really important to factor in, in in thinking about return to school and this ongoing challenge that I think is going to be a challenge for all schools and for a long time, this how to serve all pupils when some of them are in school and some of them will necessarily still be remote. Um, so that's one point. And then I think with the, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter campaign and, and the um, events of the last week, it's really an opportunity for us all to think, I think, again, about racism and stereotyping that impacts all elements of our society, including, of course, um, in education and schooling. Um, and some of the issues around unconscious bias, um, in placement of kids into different exam groups, into different sets and streams and so forth, is very well evident. And perhaps, you know, this time of reflection and highlighting of these issues does give us a time and a chance to think hard um, about how we try to attend to those issues, challenge ourselves and think carefully going forwards, including, of course, of not um, including all um, BME categories together and thinking about both the differences between different groups, but also the intersectionality and shared challenges that groups face. Right, thank you. And it is, it's such a tricky one, isn't it, this, and, and so pertinent um, and critical to the work that we're all doing. Um, so I'm just very conscious of time, folks. We've got about eight minutes left and there's loads of questions still rolling in. So I know that we may not be able to get through all of them, but there were two in particular that I did want us to cover off um, before we wrap up today. The first is around... Um, the lessons that we can learn from the experience of teacher assessment. And Nathan, you touched on this earlier in the conversation, but, you know, can we consider GCSE and A-level grades fair? Um, and how, how might that play out beyond, uh, beyond where we find ourselves? So that's the first one. And then I've got one final question for the panel. 
um, before we wrap up. So who would like to jump in? I don't mind starting. Um, um, so can, can we, it, it's something that has been in discussion for a long time in terms of um, the assessment system and whether it unfairly advantages or disadvantages some students. I, I mentioned again about cultural capital. There are in a number of subjects, um, questions are undoubtedly um, favourable towards people from certain social economic backgrounds in terms of the, the, the context. I remember there was... Um, um, there was a Spanish ex exam not too long ago, and they were talking about um, they were talking about ballet in France, and and you know it was it, it was certain situations where students who didn't have that cultural capital, um, you know, they they struggle to even access the question. They wouldn't know, and that's not a test of how good they are at Spanish, or you know, you could take different examples in different subjects. Um, the process that's happened at, at the moment where there's a heavy reliance on the teacher knowledge of, of students, in some ways, some would say that it is, um, you know, an opportunity for the people who know the students best to, to kind of to say what they do and don't deserve. Um, going forward in terms of with GCSEs and A-levels and the results that come out of, of this time, it is, you know, uh, Ofqual have said that they're going to moderate these results and they've assured students, schools um, and universities that the grades that stand will be equitable and will be the same as grades that have been previously and going forward. It's something that, you know, it needs to be thought of in terms of not just this summer, but going forward as well for the students in year nine, year 10, year seven, year eight primary schools going forward on the education that they miss, that they're not at a disadvantage. So, so I would love to think that there was an opportunity for us to <laughs> trust our teachers. I think the fact that Key Stage 2 SATs didn't happen hasn't destroyed anybody's life. It might have made some people's lives happier because they haven't gone through the, ang the angst of, of sitting those tests. Some children love sitting tests, but no one quotes Key Stage 2 sets or, uh, tests on their, on their CV. So I think... The other thing to say is there's quite a, an industry around examinations, so there's quite a lot of vested interest in keeping GCSEs alive and well. It strikes me that th there's been a debate sort of rumbling around for a while about this and whether it's right to have external examinations at 16 is probably something that we ought to be talking about because students that take them, if they, if they still exist, um, will have had a, a much diminished experience of, of learning up until the point where they take them, especially if we don't come back in the autumn. So I personally think uh, it's an opportunity. We should see everything as an opportunity to, to try and, and, and find some reform that makes things better in education. It's funny. I'm in probably one of the very few regions where there are no central exams or tests organized and all the teachers decide. Yeah, and we have a big discussion uh, about um, getting them <laughs> those tests because um, we, there is a reason about inequality, actually, because um, what we see is that sometimes if the teacher decides in group, inequality can rise. It's also something we've seen in the Netherlands. But we've added uh, a very important element uh, in the present situation is that a teacher can use uh, the information he or she received during the period of online teaching to the benefit of the student, but not against the student. So they can only use the elements they've saw, they've seen. Okay, he or she knows this. You're got, you're good. But then they have to give opportunities to the students they haven't had the opportunity to see if they are able to do it, and they have to give them chances again in school, making it more fair for everybody. This is the way how assessment was dealt with here in the situation. That's so interesting, isn't it? And such a different perspective as well. Thank you, Pedro. Right, so uh, folks, we've got one last question and a minute each on this one, please. Um, I'd like us to finish uh, on an optimistic high with a bit of a pragmatic, um, this is something people can go away and do. So um, the question is, what advice would you have for school leaders when planning for next year? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
from my point of view, this question makes me very glad that I'm not actually a school leader. Um, I mean, what a challenge. Um, but I think it's going to be a case of my, my advice would be uh, draw collectively, draw on all those associations, networks and so forth that you are a member of to share best practice and draw on the brilliant ideas and creativity of your staff as well as let's hope, you know, organizations like my own and so many others, we need a really strong collective response and we need to draw on the brilliance of the profession and the research evidence that's out there in order to mobilize in these incredibly challenging circumstances. I would, I would say, um, you know, I think it's really important to have a definitely a student-centric approach while still being flexible and realizing that you know things that we might put in place immediately might need to change and having the confidence and the courage to do that and to make those changes where we see fit it's going to be a long journey to get things back to the point where we where we want it to be we might make mistakes at first but just like anything we need to be adaptable and we need to be courageous in those decisions thank you nathan i think I just, oh sorry sorry go ahead i i think I think it's okay to show that you love your students and you love your staff. I saw I saw something yesterday evening on social media. A teacher had posted that she'd heard that one of the parents of one of her children in her class had died. And she said, it's okay to shed a few tears, isn't it? And I thought it would be very strange if you didn't. So I think we've got to learn, and perhaps we have learned from this crisis, how important humanity is. And we should just be, be prepared to... to be more reliant on each other and, and learn from each other and be more collegiate because that's what makes the world go around. Thank you, Alison. Pedro? Uh, a couple of months ago, it was normal for people to fly around the world. And if you entered an airplane, they show you that nobody watched uh, about safety. But one of the key elements in that video was uh, if there's a loss of oxygen, mm -hmm. first help yourself before helping the children. And this sounds very uh, egocentric, but if you as a teacher drop out, your children won't be helped. So also take care of yourself and each other so you will be able to care for the children. Brilliant. I mean, what a what a wonderful way to finish. I feel like um, at the start of this, you know, we were standing at the bottom of a very, very tall mountain. And hopefully what we've done today is we've started to chip away at it a little bit and give ideas on, on sharing. And, you know, the other thing that strikes me is just how human fundamentally all of this is. We started at the beginning talking about connection and stigma and reaching out to your pupils and how important that was going to be, even though they might be the pupils that we're most worried about at this point um, and finished today talking about looking after ourselves and looking after each other. So I'm going to draw it to a close here, folks. Just a huge thank you to our panel for taking the time to be with us and share their experiences. A massive thank you to all of our audience and our participants who've been with us today. Um, you know, there's lots more to discuss. It's every Thursday from four till five for the next, the next um, four Thursdays. Just thank you all around. Um, carry the conversation on, on social media and um, yeah, best of luck. Do look after yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.